I went to college in the middle of nowhere in the southern mountains. The closest city was over an hour away, and our little town just had the essentials like a post office and a Walmart. Because of this, we had to get more creative when we were bored. And through our means of entertaining ourselves, I've developed a collection of, well, odd stories. The campus is very forested, and they try to take advantage of that by adding some hiking trails. I've been up and down a couple, and they're no joke, but I had a few more adventurous friends. They would often start off on the trails, and then whenever they felt like it, they would wander off. Sometimes they found some really cool stuff and always took pictures to document. One time, they went off the trail and ended up finding a half-buried well. They took lots of pictures and took their time uncovering it, but the weird part came on their way back. They claimed they left the same way as they came in, but on their way back, part of the forest had chicken feet hanging from the branches. If you stood in the middle of where they were hung, it probably spanned a 30-foot radius, and they were fairly densely hung too, at least one on every reachable limb. They said that they were only at the well a couple of hours and that they didn't believe one person could have hung all of the feet in that time. The two of them stayed long enough to get pictures and video, verify the feet were real, then got the fuck out of there. I asked them about it, and all this said was that they thought they may have been on someone's property and that they will never go back. I looked up everything I could about chicken feet being hung from trees, but all I could find were some voodoo rituals about using them as protection charms. It's not something I will ever understand, but after living in this area for years, I know better than to fuck around with voodoo or someone who believes in it that strongly. Sadly, I don't have the pictures of this incident anymore. If I can manage to get in touch with one of them, I'll see if they still have any. Another time, some friends and I decided to go look for a local landmark, but by the time we left to go find it, it was already getting dark. Now, this landmark already had some paranormal stories attached to it, including some Native American lore and even some alien encounter stories. But my story isn't anything like those. It was supposed to be about a 20-minute drive, but I no longer trust anything my GPS tells me. It was 20 minutes before we got to a 10-mile-long dirt road that was only narrow enough for one car. In short, if we had met another person going the opposite direction, we would have been screwed. No one could tell what was on either side of the road due to the fact that the sun had fully set at this point. There were trees all around us, and when you opened the window, you could kind of hear what sounded like a river. This led us to believe the land beside us probably dropped off into a gully. About five miles in, we started seeing private property signs and were praying for there to be somewhere to turn around. We had long given up on finding this landmark. After about two miles on this road, we realized my GPS thought we were somewhere else. Also, if there were private property signs, we must have gone the wrong way. Everyone in the car was a little nervous at this point as a result of being lost on such a treacherous road. But we tried to mask it by turning the music up louder. We eventually made it to where my GPS said the road ended, but in person that wasn't the case. Up ahead, the trees cleared a bit, and to the right was an old barn that was miraculously still standing, despite appearing half-rotten. The whole barn and clearing was surrounded by a tall chain-link fence that came all the way up to the road. The combination of an old rustic barn and heavy-duty chain-link fence gave off a weird vibe, like they didn't want someone getting in or something getting out. We all watched the barn as we passed. Other than the private property signs, it was the only man-made thing we had seen in almost 10 miles. I think I saw someone, one of my friends G in the back seat spoke up above the music. Dude, don't mess with us right now, I called back playfully. Nah, I'm not kidding. There was someone at the barn. I was in the passenger seat and turned around. I looked him dead in the eyes and shook my head. The last thing we needed was people to be freaking out, because if someone lived this far off the beaten path, they sure as hell didn't want a bunch of college kids in a shiny car disturbing them at this time of day. The car clunked over a mound of rocks in the road that couldn't be missed if we tried. You could hear the stones scraping across the bottom of the car. My friend driving cringed. The sedan pushed on and didn't seem to have anything broken yet. Having a low riding car was fun when drifting around the parking lot of a KFC, but not so much when you're in fear of bottoming out in the middle of nowhere. My GPS made an alert tone, and I looked down to see the message. GPS signal lost. It had obviously misrouted, so it wasn't much of a loss overall. Though it did mean that I didn't have any phone signal to call for help if we got stuck. 
I showed it to the people sitting in the back. I think we are officially in the middle of nowhere. Everyone checked their phones, and they were all in the same boat, no signal whatsoever. At least we had stayed on the same road for probably half an hour, so we couldn't really get any more lost than we were. Up ahead we could see the trees clearing again, in another barn, similar to the one before. This one wasn't surrounded by metal fencing, but it was kind of up on a hill, so trying to turn around would have been risky. As we neared the building, we spotted another barn and some fences out in the distance. Next to the rickety structures sat a car that looked so decrepit it probably couldn't run, and behind the first two barns was a building that may have sufficed as a house. The road did continue on further, but there was a sign posted that read, Authorized Vehicles Only, or something along those lines. The road seemed even darker than the rest of the area and was even narrower than what we were currently on. Had it been daytime, or had we had a car better suited for the road, or had we been a little braver, we may have continued down that road since we were already trespassing. We may as well continue breaking the law, but it was without question at this point that we turn around and go back. We all nervously watched the buildings, almost in fear that someone would come out guns blazing. It was without question that if someone lived in these buildings, that they had a whole arsenal of weapons. The thought did cross my mind that with no signal and no one else knowing where we were, if we died out here, we might never be found. As soon as we were turned around, the driver stepped on the gas. Tires spun dirt and gravel as we tried to get out as fast as we could. When we neared the first barn and the pile of rocks that tore up the bottom of the car, we slowed down. One of my friends, H, suggested that she could go move some of the rocks to try to save the car. We could see the barn from where we were, and after what G had said the first time, we were all curious but scared of it too. No one is getting out of this car until we are off this road. The driver snapped at her and drove over the pile of rocks. We all held our breath and prayed that the car still ran because the idea of getting stuck out here with no signal in front of this creepy barn was worse than a nightmare. I didn't see anyone that time, G commented as we passed the building, but that didn't make any of us feel better. Grant. Two of the people sitting in the back were trying to distract themselves on their phones. G leaned forward and spoke quietly. Did you guys see that? Don't, the driver snapped. The three of us did see it, though. The road straightened out for a while, and a pair of headlights were visible for a split second behind us before the ensuing car turned them off or slowed down. The vehicle behind us obviously didn't want to be seen. I'm not sure how long it followed us for, or when it started, or where it came from, but for the rest of the road, I tried to pretend it wasn't there. We were almost free from the road when H let out a blood-curdling scream. The driver slammed on the brakes and looked back at her. She looked at him with big, sad eyes and said, You ran over a frog. That lightened the mood and we eventually made it off that godforsaken road. We never saw that car again and I don't think we ever told the other two about it. We stopped at a church that was at the end of the road and had a street light in the parking lot. Everyone got out and made sure the car wasn't leaking or about to fall apart or anything. My friends and I never did go find that landmark. I asked other people who had gone and seen it, though. I think we missed a turn because they said it was only about a quarter mile down a dirt road. I've given up on my GPS now. I recently tried to find the road on Google Maps to see if it actually leads to anywhere interesting. I think I found it, but it's unmarked. You can only see it if you have satellite images on, and you can occasionally see it as a path in the woods. It would be the perfect place to hide something you don't want found, and the people up there probably didn't have an address. My best guess is that they were moonshiners or meth cooks or something. Now, if you guys are interested, I can try to see if my friends still have pictures of the chicken feet. Most of them were sent over Snapchat, though, and I didn't think to screenshot them at the time. And if you have any thoughts on the purpose of hanging chicken feet, let me know because I never found a real answer. My college is pretty creepy at night. I suppose the same could be said of most sizable public buildings, a byproduct of the eerie contrast between the bustling, well-lit corridors and their nocturnal, desolate appearance. Be that as it may, I would still argue that the building in case goes past this simple, dissonant clash of habit, meeting familiar unfamiliarity. The building where I have classes until 10, twice a week, shuts off most lights in the second floor by 8 o'clock, as most classrooms up there are not being used past that time. 
I suppose this is an opportunity for the personnel to start closing up as soon as possible. In fact, the personnel are so eager to close up that one time our class was actually locked inside the building. We had stayed past our scheduled time trying to get through presentations that were taking far too long only to find the front door locked. The entire class, professor included, ended up leaving through a low window. That event wasn't scary though, just amusing. What scares me is the unlit second floor. I think it didn't used to feel scary per se, possibly just a bit eerie, but now I can't possibly go there at nighttime. The college's buildings are enormous. It's a really old university, and they took their classical inspirations a little too far. The halls are at least 20 feet high, and one can't help but feel dwarfed by the scale, especially when walking through them while they're empty. It's truly a grand waste of space, but it now just adds to the creepiness of it all. I am aware of the range of possible explanations for the events I am about to recall. Trust me, I've taken shelter under their comforting embrace for far longer than anyone else. Even so, I can't help but feel that spreading my experiences might help someone else out there in the future. Class ended early that day. After an entire day of classes, all I wanted to do was head home. But I still had a 45-minute commute, and my physiological needs weren't going to wait that long without putting me through severe discomfort. I chose to go to the second-floor bathrooms, as I usually did at that time. I am not particularly fond of public bathrooms out of hygienic considerations. So choosing the second floor bathrooms that had already been cleaned for the day was a matter of course. The bathrooms in that building have motion sensors. I honestly hate those. There's something truly unpleasant about the lights suddenly going out while you're doing your business. You will then have to wave your arm around until the damn sensor detects movement or enjoy defecating in the dark, whichever you prefer. It's annoying, especially when you have the need to stay for a bit longer due to an upset stomach. It was just this type of scenario that day. I went up there, marveled in the usual eeriness of the empty hall, and went in the bathroom. It was empty, as usual. Sitting on the toilet, I allowed myself to sigh deeply and enjoyed the odd catharsis that comes from a moment of rest after a stressful day, mixed with the relief of attending to overdue physiological needs. The lights went out, a few cusses and waves later, they returned. A short time later, they went out again. I stretched my arm and waved, but the lights didn't turn back on. Damn sensors, I thought. I stretched my arm further and even got slightly up from the toilet to try to activate the sensor. Reaching up into the darkness, my arm hit something. It couldn't be the wall. My arm was stretched towards the door, and it couldn't be the door either because the stall was pretty big. Besides this bit of logic, the feeling certainly wasn't that of a door or a wall either. It felt warm and damp, perhaps even slightly slimy. I could also feel rough points in between that felt oddly sharp. The feeling was also shifting around, letting me know that whatever I touched had movement. I felt the slimy warmness wiggle around my arm as if I had been licked by it. I staggered backwards and fell besides the toilet, ignoring the pain and reaching frantically for my phone for a light source. The phone was in my jeans pocket, and the panic wasn't letting me retrieve it with as much speed as I wished. I felt something touch my legs spreading throughout and screamed. I used my left hand to swipe at it, but it was no use as the feeling of it enveloping my arm overtook me once more. The phone was finally out, and with a click of a button light streamed back into the stall. I heard something that I couldn't identify, and I was showered in the light of the bathroom. On the verge of a panic attack, I looked at my arms and saw what looked like a rash stretching from about my wrist to my elbow. They also felt damp. I hurried out of the bathroom as soon as possible, storming to the door to the left of the stall. I bet I looked like a madman, half crying and running for the front door. I'm just thankful I didn't run into anyone I knew. The rash-looking redness that covered my arms disappeared shortly after. Retrospective is a bitch sometimes. I showered myself in excuses and logical explanations to wipe away what I conceived of as irrational fear. Even so, retrospective keyed me into a rather upsetting detail, something I couldn't possibly have taken into consideration while panicking. The single light bulb that illuminates the stall did not glow uniformly and at once. I started seeing the light from the light bulb from left to right. I have been to that bathroom plenty of times. Those lights come on at once. 
Whatever I felt in the dark had been covering the light source physically. It stood in its way to keep me in the dark. When I turned on the phone, it fled from left to right, allowing the light that had never been off to shine over the stall. Whatever I felt in the dark was probably still standing in the bathroom to my right as I exited. It probably watched me as I ran for the door. I don't go to the unlit sections of that campus anymore, and whenever I use a bathroom with light sensors, I make sure to keep my phone at hand. I suggest you do the same. I live in an old apartment building. I've been here for about two years and my roommate and I have had very few scary experiences so far, except for this one that happened last summer. It was around four in the morning when we were woken from a dead sleep by the fire alarms going off throughout our entire four-story apartment building. Seeing as this place is occupied mostly by seniors, we figured someone had left a pot on the stove again. I grumbled and blindly grabbed for a blanket. Last time we had a false alarm, I was left shivering and barefoot on the sidewalk waiting for the fire department, and I wasn't about to let that happen again. My roommate and I put on our shoes, I grabbed my phone and keys, and we poked our head out into the hallway. Nothing seemed off. The hall was empty. No one else had come out of their apartments yet. Reluctantly, my roommate and I walked down the hall toward the lobby. We figured our neighbors would soon follow suit. It was only when we went through the lobby and out the front door that we realized something was actually wrong. A handful of people who had already come out of the building were running and shouting about how the building was actually on fire this time. We followed them around to the side of the building as more and more people fled in their pajamas, and to our horror we saw an apartment on the top floor belching out flames. People were frantic, searching for water, a ladder, anything. Someone remarked that there was a lady who lived in that apartment who had mobility issues and she needed to be rescued asterisk. Now, asterisk and asterisk, where the hell was the fire department asterisk? My roommate was quite disturbed by the whole scene, so we decided to go back to the front of the building, away from the fire. On our way, we saw a guy jump off his balcony to the ground. He rolled when he landed, but I think it still really hurt, judging from how he sat on the grass and groaned for a while. He was lucky to only be on the second floor. There was chaos, yelling, screaming, an odd mix of panic and disinterest, especially among the senior citizens who didn't want to leave the building because using the stairs was so difficult. The fire department arrived much quicker than they ever had before, seeing as this was a real emergency. And it wasn't long before elderly ladies in nightgowns were being rescued via ladders and wheeled off to the hospital next door. At one point, the man who lived below the apartment on fire had a screaming episode at one of the landlords, the one that looked like a walking skeleton with an oxygen tank and a scooter. By the time the fire department got everything under control, it was around 6 or 7 a.m. The sun was up and people were beginning their morning commute. The fire department had blocked off our whole street, which must have been a pain, and the entire population of my building sat on the curb in pajamas and blankets. Little kids, old people, broke college kids, the works. The community really pulled together that morning. The public bus service gave us a couple buses to sit and warm up in instead of standing around on the chilly sidewalk. Paramedics handed out blankets and assessed injuries. The people in the surrounding houses were kind enough to bring us water and snacks. One lady brought a serving tray with mugs of tea from her own kitchen and offered it to anyone she could find. My mom came down to rescue my roommate and I, even though she lived an hour outside of town and hadn't even showered yet. She brought us breakfast in a change of clothes as we didn't know when we'd be allowed back into the building. The most disturbing details of what had just taken place that morning came to us as we were waiting on the bus. Everyone was talking about the fire, of course, but one man had a particularly horrifying detail to add. He'd heard through the grapevine that the lady whose apartment caught fire never made it out of the building. Sadly, we suspected as much, with her mobility issues and all. But there was more. The firefighters apparently found her in the hall. She had made it out of her apartment, but couldn't escape the smoke. Whether she died from smoke inhalation or from burns, we aren't sure. But one thing that man said that sticks with me is that someone said that as they stood outside and watched the flames, they heard the woman screaming, help me, I'm burning. I've always been afraid of burning to death, and the idea that my neighbor may have had such a horrifying end is deeply disturbing. 
I know the man who lived below her heard her screaming. He wouldn't stop talking about it. I think he ended up with a form of PTSD from this event, and I don't blame him. We were all brought to a community center where the fire department and emergency response volunteers helped bring some clarity to the situation and told us what to expect. Everyone was very kind and sympathetic to us. Whatever we needed, they provided for us. I think all of that is pretty standard procedure, but still, I was extremely thankful to the kindness of the volunteers, firefighters, paramedics, and Good Samaritans. It was pretty surreal to be in a situation like that. We had almost nothing on us. My roommate hadn't thought to grab her phone, so she had to borrow mine to let her family know she was okay. We had no money, no ID, none of the essentials, and we had no idea how long we would be homeless. I hadn't been so happy to have my mum with me in a long time. I felt like a scared little girl, even if I didn't show it. We were lucky the fire happened on the opposite end of the building from us. Our unit was totally unaffected, and we were one of the few allowed back into our apartment that same day. The building stunk of smoke for weeks. Even though the fire took place on the fourth floor in a single apartment, the damage was extensive. Even on the ground floor, the walls were blackened with ash. When they attempted to start fixing up the building, they found asbestos in the walls. A few people were forced to move out of their apartments, and we're talking people who had lived there for around 30 years. I remember the night we were allowed back into our apartment. I wanted to box up my most important possessions and keep them in my car, as if I thought the building was going to catch fire again. My home didn't feel safe anymore, and it wouldn't for several weeks. It would take a long time for us to hear anything about what caused the fire. Last I heard, a space heater was to blame, but I don't know for sure. In the days that followed, the fire was featured on the front page of the local paper. The family that lived just down the hall from us were featured in the picture. The article spelled out details that I had already heard. It labeled the guy that lived below the fire as a hero for attempting to save the lady upstairs. It was a valiant effort, but there was nothing he could have done without endangering himself. I feel sorry for him, and I often wonder if the guilt keeps him up at night. Sometimes I think about the lady who passed away in this building. I listen to a lot of ghost stories, so I wonder if her spirit haunts this place. Her sudden and horrifying death would be the sort of thing to make a ghost linger on Earth, wouldn't it? So many things left unfinished. Regardless, I hope she's at peace, and I hope that my neighbors have been able to find some semblance of peace as well. Four months later, we've regained a sense of normalcy. Things are back to how they were before. If you ignore the orange tarps around the side of the exterior, the restoration vans that come and go every day, and the security guards stationed in the lobby, the damaged wing is still closed while they try and sort out the asbestos situation. But for those of us who live on the other end of the building, things are relatively normal. I hope they stay that way.